best describe the dance body green garters and give the words of shepherd's hay and things of that sort. But what he didn't get is anybody who actually uh, remembered what he would call normal dances. Uh, that were just the, the odd corner and two with two dances. The yeah, second problem is that in all the notes that both made, there are no descriptions of how the hand moved. Very little about steps, I might say, but no description of hand movement. So it's very difficult to use that and say, well, hey, the duck and go. There was just a gap. We're very fortunate in the late, I was very fortunate in the late 1960s, um, in a time of dance we were having, and we were had one or two annual tours, one in, that went through North Leach. And in North Leach we met uh, on one occasion, and I have to say that we had a, a rather mixed side at Abbey Dillon, all the old men and one or two youngsters from the university dancing with them. And we were surrounded by small kids, so we were actually doing a stick dance, which we had to borrow from somebody else, with sticks of rock. And the idea was the bits of rock were knocked all over the children who were rushing around having a good time. And one little man in the corner was just a little bit upset by that, so we had a chat with him, and he told us that his father came from Ducklington, and his father had danced the Morris, which turned out his father had actually known one or two Dukes, and he had known the, um, the Bampton dancers. So we arranged to go and see him on another occasion, given just the right amount of beer, he actually danced jockey to the fair for three of us. Uh, on another occasion, he was persuaded to remember another bit of the dance. The important bit was not that his knowledge was very small, but the fact that he could do the dance at all and actually show how the way things go. Now, have I got a musician at all today, or do I have to dance and play? Is somebody who will play me jockey to the fair?
one or two of the older Bantam people that I met was able to confirm that the arms had gone over and used to be one of those who would get up and do the old gym. So, at the time, I started to talk about 1970 ish, age 60, 70. There was a need in the revival for a tradition that was Bampton like in ease and the dance and liveliness, which wasn't Bampton. You have to appreciate that every so often the traditional sides, for whatever the moral reason, would find other people doing their dances embarrassing and they wish out of the 350 dancers that were to choose from, that the rest of us would choose not to do theirs. So there seemed a heaven sent opportunity to take the material that existed on the dance shapes and put them together as ducking. And we had this enthusiasm at that period since we were to construct a ducking tradition. Now, the work was done with Bath City, with Tammy Reynolds, and the undergraduates basically. And we tried a fair number of ways of interpreting the dance. And what it came back to is the way Jarvis, and I don't know his surname, Jarvis is what people called him for his putt in the putt. It's his Christian name. Uh, the way he danced turned out the most satisfactory way of doing it. Now, there are more than one way of doing duck and fin, and I'll come on to that. In particular, I will want to discuss the way the Stroud dance, because they take a Bampton eye view of Ducklington, and the way in Ducklington Village dance, who take a Witchford Forest view of Ducklington. All these interpretations are as valid as any other, or as invalid, depending on what position you like to take. Right? Um, as far as I'm concerned, dancers stand or fall on whether they're good dancers. Nothing to do with, in fact, whether they're authentic, whatever that means, because there's no doubt an awful lot of very good dancers that have disappeared into limbo forever. And there's no doubt the number of dancers that have been bad dancers collected, or dancers badly collected, I should say. Um, even Mr. Sharp made dreadful mistakes in collecting from some of the places he went to. Later inquiries showed that the dancers have done in significantly different ways to what he had. But I say different, I won't say better. That's really not the point. Uh, diversity is all. So let's get sets together, sets of six, and uh, we'll try one or two of the standard dancers before I try the other one. Choose to interpret this 
as you dance, the top pair dance and go to the bottom, the next pair dance and go to the middle, and the bottom pair having got to the top dance and turn around on the spot. It is quite possible to actually interpret that everybody goes to the bottom so that you don't actually reverse the set each time, and that's the way Duckington Village named dance. Right? But we're going to do it the way Mr. Sharp saw. Right? So, uh, let's all practice together. Just really pay nothing.
the second point is what do you do in the half house? <laughs> and you notice I avoid mentioning it before you try. There's a problem. There's a problem. In Jockey to the Fair, where the hay would occur, when the man did the jig, he danced. This sort of thing. When he did Princess Royal, it was sort of. same movement, we had two different sorts of stepping. So the question comes, was the hay one, two, three, one, two, three, and back step, was it one, two, three, and one, two, three, and spring three? And the answer is, you take your choice. <laughs> it depends really on the dance, in my opinion. Right? Um, now, I'll tell you my preference. My preference, you know, I like dances with wedding. Another old fashioned traditional phrase. I like them to have a go, a bit of go about them. And I like tunes that have drive. And I like dances that have push. Right? And this is all very nice if you're at my age, weight, and tired, you know, for rest. But in general, I like to see the spring capers. Right. Now we're doing a half a, so let's just walk half a. The one, two, three, and one, two, three. They spring capers turning out. Spring and spring. So you're going to some pressure whirling tops. Not exactly top like, you know what I mean? But turning all in. And we do our our shows one, two. Three, four, and half a back. One, go on, go on, half a back. Tiam, pum, ti, ti, yum, and spring, ta, 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 ta. And of course, this being nothing, girl, we end facing up. Could we actually just do the A, Chorus.
two and two is the last one. Now, we'll come on to the tap capers. I call them tap capers rather than slow because the trouble is Alan Foreman didn't slow them down. He just did. But it's a bit like, you know, just did all the hand movements down here, you know. I can't like step dancing in a way. But of course, I don't even remember persuading anybody to dance it like that. Because we're all conditioned to slow things slow. And I'll be quite honest with you, aesthetically, that doesn't look very good in here. Right? So the tendency is to go one, tap, dee 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 tap, dee dee with a big two arm show on the cape. So, ready? Step, tap, cape, cape, step, tap, cape, cape, then it's ya, da dee 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 ya, dee ya, da dee dee ya, da ya, da dee dee ya.
Duffington, I had terrible trouble with just getting into slows with them, as we've just had, right? Because I came from a side that did it one way to a side that did it slightly differently. Uh, differently, not any more steps than before, but the, where the stress came, you know, where the boom needs to drop. And I was surprised, I hadn't realised, you know, that how uh, different sides, different individuals can actually have the same dance notation and come out with different emphases. Now recently, I was adjudicating at a festival, arts festival, with young children doing Morris castles. And I was surprised to find that these kids, you watch them, and all six were going up and down like the bells on an engine, you know, all over the place. <laughs> and yet when you look at their feet, they're actually all hitting the ground at the same time. <laughs> Nobody explained to them, though, the phase difference between feet and body. You know, some were actually sore, hitting the ground as the up, some sort of touch as the start of slowing down, and so on. You know, there's quite a difference in emphasis. Musician plays, of course, to the stress in the body movement, not to the feet. And there's a problem. You may not realise there's a problem, but now you know. <laughs> right? You can have a problem in your coming room. Right. Now, the next one we're going to do is Bonnie Green Garters. Uh, not because of intrinsic merit of dance, but um, it being one of the few Morris stories that the Duncans had managed to dance around the Maypole before going off each day. And one day when they threatened to forget to do it, the old man said he'd saw the Maypole then. If you go to the village green, you'll see a place that point eight to you where the Maypole was, in fact, also the path around which the Morris dancers danced. What they don't tell you is that the Maypole wasn't there, it was actually in the main street. And what you're seeing is where they used to tell the goat. <laughs> <laughs> rain and rain. <laughs> 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 right. Foot up, you can do. Or can you? Yes, you can really, because you've just done it. Let's sort of practice. Um, how are you on the on green? Eight.
of the range of the sidestep. You sidestep if you go range, let's just set this walk it right. You sidestep moving out the left and in <laughs> as far as you can, and then you turn back on the two screen and buy the set. So then you have to go left into the middle. And if you're in the middle, you start with that's very embarrassing. Eight. And rain to your right. As some of the corner dancers consist of foot up, range, 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 as it were, it's worthwhile knowing about the the Bonnie Green way of other ways of doing rains, because you can then, by the way, I didn't do rains with the spring papers all the way. You looked like, that's right, yes. <laughs> it was going well enough already. Um, you can use those instead. Now, the authority for things like that will be assigned like Wheatley. Now, if you've you ever met Wheatley, they've got foot up, rains, and hay. That's all. There are no other figures. They're just like this dance, really. But you can do those with ordinary stepping, with uh, furries, you know, spring capers, and so on, in any sort of mixture. Right? Any way you like. And they do. And they make exciting dances. They're actually able to build up to the climax and move them on by in fact switching from one way to the other, and the foreman calls as he goes along what it is. You know, so when you come to the dancers with the range, you can call range, which you know is range, or range of sidestep, range of spring, whatever you need for that particular time. You know, we've got to do refresh with Roy, there's one point that's worth mentioning there, because I've nearly got picked up by position. If you're going to call rounds with slow, in a dance you don't normally have slows in it, it's as well to Oh, yes, yes, obviously. <laughs> I was making an implicit assumption there that only an idiot before man <laughs> calls slows, which I did with all at the best of times. Um, mind you, I didn't, yeah, if you haven't did it before man, probably you shouldn't carry you should do things with it. It's like people who vote conservative. <laughs> they deserve what they get. <laughs> Whereas, Folk labour, none of us deserve what we get. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, you see, I was going to say, other traditions, you take a tradition like Adderbury, eight figures, degree of interpretation because uh, as collectors they weren't the ones that got published, you know. There's, if you've ever seen Adderbury Village compared with Adderbury, as it were, Adderbury for the world. Uh, they actually do things differently. They start with the same material, the same understanding, but there's a difference of interpretation possible. But at the breed, again, they would choose the figures, the same, the mood, the dance, how long they had at that point, and so on. The, the dancers are in control of the dance. The dance is not in control of the dancers. Right? The difference between a beginner and an experienced dancer, as a beginner, is somebody to whom the dance dictates exactly what they do. Right, or before them, that's anyhow. Uh, an advanced dancer, in the terms of workshops, is somebody who actually is able to, uh, as it were, exploit the dance. And an experienced dancer, to my mind, is somebody who can express themselves through the dance. In other words, they're no longer worrying about what do I do and how do I do it. It's I feel joyful and I am joyful. Sort of thing, you know. In other words, they're able to put, they're adding something for themselves to what they're doing. And today, we're making the assumption that you fit somewhere between the last two categories, right? You're here to enjoy yourself. <laughs> Let's try another one anyhow. Um, two for two. Oh, let's, let's do um, Shepherd's Hay. That, that would be tripping up. You can all do. Can't you? Right. Ankles, hips, kiss. Right. Face up, two by two. Any other Shepherd's Hay back?
Which direction you face for the tapping? Right? Face across, you might do a traditional way, or face up for the clapping because of the problem of turning into it whoever's at the top. Yeah. There's always the problem in the ducklings and the, the, the last pair in the three for three, or the first pair of the chorus, actually have to have their wits about them to be ready for the next movement. You know, it's no use thinking, what do I do next, when you should be anticipating what you're doing next. Yeah. So, this is all I'm familiar with. Right, so let's do, um, there's an example, face across, everybody do uh, a single show to your left, one, two, three, one, two, three, two spring keepers with clap, and half pay.
solitude of soul. All these had an origin somewhere. Right? An eye level, you know, is a, a good goey tune. Now, there are problems with finding tunes from Morris, because I need to appreciate most 20th century social music has an offbeat. You know, uh, they don't, if I think of it, ragtime. Yeah, they don't. 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 What good strong. That is not the characteristic of a Cotswold Morris, unless it's one of the traditions that survived into the 20th century. Bampton and Camden, who have been active traditions this century, rather than heading to Abingdon and so on, which are sort of revivals, or, you know, keep the thing going. But the living tradition has picked up the off the you know, But the classic Cotswold Morris, as we do, has a you know, it's Tunes which actually have that sort of rhythm in them, which is why it's difficult to take any old tune and do the Morris to it, Cops or Morris to it. But there are some, there are some, I'll meet one or two. So we'll have a few moments break. <laughs>
three, and number four and number six change places diagonally. Pass right shoulders, right? Now, now this pair and the other pair, the other diagonal corner, cross right shoulders. Then the same first corners that crossed, as it were, same places. That's this pair and that pair cross. And then you really change to their partner. Can you do that again? <laughs> <laughs> and they're halfway round the line of surgery, right? Well, not that set, that set's got four. Now get back to where you were, it's the same, same amount, the same thing. It's a one and three. It's a one and three.
based on jumps, capers, and drive. Right? Now, it's like that because it was worked up, in my case, with Bar City, who were basically a university site. Young, vigorous, not terribly well controlled dancers. <laughs> we did our dance so well that one year we went on a day's tour to film it and we filmed it and we thought that was fantastic. And we looked at it some way afterwards and realised it wasn't. It just felt fantastic. <laughs> the fact is, nobody had enough experience to dance particularly well. But it's still very enjoyable and you can get away with murder in front of a crowd if it's like that with lots of flurry and movement. And they can't really see the fact that you're not only doing all, everybody doing something different, but you're probably all doing it wrong. <laughs> That's irrelevant. Right, now, another dance. This is what I stole from Jack Strauss. Face me. Face me. No. It's sort of a bit like the two by two. Now, I'm going to have to explain this on a two by two basis, but about it all flows. The top pair, the top pair, right, do a side step to your left. To your left, to your right, and then do two spring capers casting out to the bottom. One, and then come back. As they turn off into their spring capers, you pair move forward doing the side step. Right, so go off and go. Side, don't move. Side step, side step, go. Side step, side step. And you turn. Right, you turn it. Now, having got to that far, you come up the middle with two screen cables. One. And you also will So back to where you were. And I'll. Oh, you won't back to where you were. I'm amazing. Right. Now, we're working out this. You. Say so, say. You can't. You can't stop. You get four more two steps. So, I'll be going. Ready? Side step left and side step right and side step left and side step right and side step left and side step right and far east and half the
and for it, it's been burnt name twice and rebuilt since the time of Henry VIII, but we don't mention that. And that's where Catherine of Aragon arrived. She arrived at Plymouth and worked her country, and met Prince Arthur and Prince Henry. Now they were stopped at the local hundred tree at Hazley Leaf and told it's bad luck to see the bride before the wedding. Now we all know that's a load of rubbish anyway. But they said, hey stupid, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> and the world changed. <laughs> yes. So beware of these things. Right. So <laughs> Catherine of Aragon is the Spanish lady. Right? And that's why the tune's called the Spanish lady, and I don't care how you, you like to call it. But its interest is that she brought in her entourage people who did the so-called Spanish dancers, which were the earliest figure dancers, and had an influence on the growth of what became the English country dance. She also brought a black and more with her who did the Morisco, not necessary in this particular place. But it, it does mean a tune like... We can use that as well. And of course... A green sleeve for Henry VIII. That's wonderful what you can do with a bit of pseudo vocal. Still. Uh, well, it fills in the gap while everybody takes a deep breath and dancing. Like that. But the thing is... The movement of it is the crane. She was become the crane, the Queen of England, you see. So what you do is form a crane. Now that's a good enough explanation you're getting there. <laughs> Let's try the whole course.
wanted to do something a little different. They like the movement. So what they were doing is a dance called Bobby Shafto, which in fact is Lollipop Man done with your partner. So if you all face across and you do the, the side step left, side step left, everybody left, right, spring capers, jumping into line, <laughs> right shoulders. So you, you can go around the circle, rather like you do the two for two dancers, and then straight into a hay. I don't know, I'll take through. And straight into a hay. No, you shouldn't have a problem with the hay because it just means you've turned date a bit already. You're going that way. You two come up the middle. You have this one. You're hay up.
edited government, I suppose. <laughs> most of these things do. Um, it's, as it were, a draft towards one of the meditation groups. Um, next set of uh, handouts. Not handouts. Um, what do we call oh, workshops? Yeah. Um, we haven't made the progress in recent year or two that we had expected to, and uh, I have to say at least half a dozen additions in the pipeline in various states of preparedness. Um, should, as far as I'm concerned, Sherbourne, Ducklington and Stanton Harcourt are the ones I'm happily working on myself, but there's Kirkington. Um, and so on. There are a fair number coming along, which are based on a principle very much like the workshop, you know, this sort of workshop, that it's what is it is commonly done as a reference, but not trying to make value judgments about what is right or wrong, because on the whole it's what's right or wrong for you or your sign, as it were. And what other teams make of it may not be to our liking. It's really not our place to judge. So in fact, as with the weekly, we try to be inclusive of the way people do things. And of course, one of the big problems there is that when you come to dance courses, they can transfer quite happily from one tradition to another with no great difficulty. So you see these, and that's really why the hand is there this morning. The, the back end of invented dancers sets a list of choruses. And you just take these, if you like them, and adapt and fiddle with them, but use them in whichever way you like to do. You know, I mean, that's the way it was, as far as we can tell, and therefore that's the way it should be. At one time, for example, we, the whole Morris board always did getting upstairs from Headington as a mass dance. But the fact is, Kimber got that from somebody else who's not a Headington dance at all. But Mr. Sharp paid him to go and find Morris dancers. <laughs> so some of what we came as Headington is not Headington. Some of what is no part of Headington is what he remembered, in inverted commas, having seen somebody else do something like this. Uh, the thing is, it doesn't actually matter at all. So that's a plug for our sheet. So anyway. um, it's still missing, I say, other interpretations even like this, so it's very much a work in progress. And the committee has not had it to go with trying to say whether it's intelligible or not. Um, that's where you discover in the committee that when you say step onto the other foot, you don't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> But the Morris world is full of people <laughs> who are convinced that's exactly what you meant and will proceed then to dance with them. <laughs> Stanton Harcourt. Uh, Stanton Harcourt, yeah, everything's, they're not enough Morris, you know, that's collected. This is, they're all different sort of story. Uh, Stanton Harcourt, it's down on the bend of the river. You, know, you, you go up the river from Oxford, it bends around past Ancient. Going to Stanton Harcourt, then it curves up again past New York, rain towards Stanton. And although it's not far from Englishur, and not far from Duckington, and not far from Bampton and so on, in actually, they're all different. In the past, neighbouring sides wanted to be different from other people rather than better. It was easier to be different. But that is still as far as I've seen major motivation of sides today. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, occasionally some are better, we're proud that they exist, but my side isn't one of them. Well, Stanley Huckle, there was a man, Percy Manning, at the back end of the 19th century, who employed a, well, he was called himself a geologist, but he was really a glorified tramp with some education. And he sent this man off around the Cotswold looking for relics. Relics were peeling horns, pipes, tabers, anything to do with the Morris, because Percy Manning was going to give a lecture at the Corn Exchange in Oxford, um, illustrated by all these bits and pieces. And what he did, he went to each village and found some Morris dancers and found out the ring relics. And in doing so, he made a note of who was in the last side, who they were, what their occupation was, something about them. And occasionally made some notes about the dancers. 
And it's Stanton Harcourt, well not at Stanton, at Yarnton, you met a man from Stanton Harcourt who'd actually danced in the side and he described the dancers to him. Now, one of the great things about early collectors is that if you haven't seen the Morris, the description of it is unhelpful. <laughs> As Chapman found when he was um, collecting, no, not Chapman, um, Graham, Graham was collecting Bidford, he had a problem what to do with the repeats, the endless repeats. So in the written notation, he just forgot about them. Yeah. Now, you can imagine what that does to the average Morris notation. You see, it means that the chorus appears once, uh, possibly only the first half of it. <laughs> yeah. And figures can appear in halves. You know, things like this. So the total notation can look a little odd if all you ever do is describe a new thing that appeared. And this, this is true of these descriptions for Stan and Hargrove, that uh, they actually are fragments of dance notations, particular courses. And <coughs> on their own, they are more or less unintelligible. Having said that, um, there was another source, so this is important. He lived in Oxford, a friend of Percy Manning, was a man called um, A.R. Williams, who, he was a don, his wife was prominent in Oxford society, and they had three daughters who were noted for being eccentric in days when eccentricity was considered fairly normal. <laughs> uh, and there appears to be all sorts of anecdotes, the weird things, including one who cheerfully would have, you know, had a bicycle would have cycled 50, 60 miles away from home just for fun of it. You know, in the days when roads were not made up and bicycles were bone shakers and things of that sort, there were no maps for a drive. Cycling at night, thing like that. But they're full of, there are lots of stories floating around the Cotswold about the Williams. Still, fortunately, um, he, being a friend of Manning's, when Manning's papers were deposited in the Bodleian, um, he saw an opportunity to follow some of it up. And he and his wife went, who were friends also of Clive Carey. And the reason I knew their existence was that there were letters in Clive Carey's papers. Or at least there were when Clive Carey was alive and he told me about them. Um, he used to go to places and he'd write long letters to Clive. He was, went to Banton on a regular basis and wrote notes about the dancers. But bearing in mind that this world <coughs> had nothing to do with the revival, therefore I had no idea about the sharp jargon for describing things. <coughs> and therefore what you and I would describe as a double or a back step or a caper required several paragraphs of writing. And this man appeared to pride himself on one of the windows because he collected Nutting Girl from Stanton Harcourt, eight pages of closely written description. There were on and on and on. And his viewpoint of his movement was such that it is a struggle to actually know what he's writing about. But all the same, what we've got there is a description of a complete Stanton Harcourt dance. We also, in the same papers, are some tunes and other bits and pieces. But the tunes are a little odd in the sense that there are some of them are note for note the tunes that Sharp collected from elsewhere. Now, one of the problems about uh, people who collect, as it were, um, just little bits is that Sharp, particularly, but also Clyco, were quite happy for people they collected from to write out a copy of what the collector had. And that was the only way to reassure somebody about what was written down, to let them have a copy. So there are a number of places where there are copies of the tunes that Sharp had wrote out, as in one for example, and the notes, the handwritten in Asker, there were a set of notes, uh, uh, sorry, a copy of the Sharp collected notes on the dance and so on. So the, that sort of thing went on. And there is this basic problem that's circulating, that was circulating in the Cotswolds as were um, the background of connected material just to confuse the next um, generation of connectors. <coughs> so it may be that Williams, who say, knew the collectors who was involved with them, could well, uh, as it were, the material be a mixture of some things he did himself and things he got from and there's just no way of knowing. Unfortunately, I had access to the papers only via Clive.
Clive Carey, well, not Clive Carey, he died, his son Henry organised me to see one of the William's daughters, unfortunately the more eccentric of the one, who brought the stuff down to Claygate and let me sit in somebody's drawing room for an afternoon to have a look at them and make what notes I wanted to. They were then whisked away and I don't know uh, what happened to them afterwards. Um, perhaps I didn't want to know at the time because she was a little old for some of to it. Made more carvings of her normal. So that it is. So we have, have a dance which gives us a clue, a bit more clue on how it goes. And it's putting these bits together uh, to emphasize it's a reconstruction that we actually have a tradition. But you're left with things, this is like a, uh, the clapping dance, like Princess of Royal and the clock. You see, the clock. Now, what do we mean by the clock? Now, what, what tune does the clock bring to mind? You see, well, like grandfather's clock. We've no idea where that was really the tune, but it happens to fit the movements, as you were, or you put it down to the tune. But we don't know. The clock, after all, might have been a bit of local humour. It's um, Longbro, the, the fool for Longbro, came from Lower Swell and used to wear a padlocking chain on his waistcoat. And those who didn't know him used to think this was terribly funny and come up and say, I say, man, what's the time? And he'd put a hit him on the head and say, just struck one. <laughs> <laughs> well, before television humour wasn't very subtle, since Beagle it isn't very subtle again. <laughs> um, you know, it, you have a danger you see, of reading into the past, the present, as it were, your own interpreting. And what it was a hundred years ago, what was funny to think like this, what people do really is unknowable. As I was saying earlier on, what people did, even if you talk to your parents or grandparents about what life was like, you can't actually get the mental image of what it was like because they don't describe enough detail for you actually to put it together. You know, I've talked to my parents a great length of great things, and unfortunately all I have in my, in my mind is a child's eye view of what it was like in the late 30s. I have not the slightest idea of what it was like for the sort of problem. Uh, and this carries over to the models. Still, that doesn't really matter. There's no more information to gather, so we have to make the most of what we have got. Right? No. It's unusual, Michael. You start by facing across. Let's just face across. Um, what sort of tune would you like to play? Constantly? Well, that's the one I want to play. Obviously, it is not a universal rule, otherwise all sets would look the same. 
but treat that as a, a good start. I understand from those who are interested that the, the club Norris, the northwest Norris, as you were, tends to be stick tip to stick tip. Right? You know, when you're holding it there, you are sort of just somewhat larger. Only because Cotswold lanes are small and northwest roads are wide, I believe. <laughs> but when you try it, there's no doubt that the larger set that you get with the northwest Morris, you know, is needed. You know, aesthetically it's very good. So that's the sort of size of it. Well, the first one is dance on the spot with a back step at the end. The second figure is forward and back. And I mean forward and back, not a half chip, you just heard, forward to me, dee dee, on the sort of first strong beat, you know, ready to dee yum, bum dee 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 dee, back step, dee 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 dee, and again, yum, bum dee 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 Strong movement in the front, that first step in, strong. The, the reason for it is, it's just how you look, the body language of the Morris. You know, if you're weak kneed, you know, good English phrase, you know, and slack and slow accelerating to something, the Morris looks sloppy because that's exactly what it is. <laughs> Slack and sloppy, it will look slack and sloppy, and the audience will think you're slack and sloppy, and their reaction to you will be slack and sloppy. Right? But Morris isn't like that. But Morris is exciting, it requires drive. Right? Drive means thinking about acceleration and thrust into things. It means that when you jump into movement, you do not land on your feet, heels on the ground, and then have to rotate forward before you can push into it, because you've lost that important fraction of a second that matters in getting into a move. When you jump, you know, the only way to move is to fall over. <laughs> now, if you lean forward, after a while, you go. Right? <laughs> and that's what you're trying to achieve. You're trying to get your centre of gravity away from being over your feet. And the faster you can do that, within the reason, is you have to say the Morris dance, don't you? Yeah. Um, always find a way of taking your feet from underneath you. Yeah. Um, the faster you get it, the more drive you have. Right? Which means when you jump, you land, you know, if you, you stand, Stand with your heels against one of the cracks in the pavement in the floor. Right? When you jump, land with your toes where your heels were. Against that crack. But don't move your body, just rotate. Right? You know. Yeah, you ready? When you go on up there, that's right, you see? As you, as you land, remember, jumping itself is a, you have to bend. <laughs> jump with, that's usually a problem, but the ones up here, the big ones, you know, the ones that uh, players are used to admire, that's right, that's tiny. you have to bend the legs a bit to jump, <laughs> right, well, it's alright, if you try, try standing with straight legs and don't use your thighs, you're lucky if you can get off the ground at all. <laughs> You have to bend. It's absolutely fun. This bend of the knees to get the thigh muscles to contribute is fundamental to jumping. It's fundamental move. In fact, it's so fundamental, it's called classical dance, the movement. The movement. So you have to bend it. So when you jump and you're landing, you're already coming down, as it were, coiling up the spring, coming down, ready to move off. Which is just as well because you're on the point of falling over <laughs> and you need that coiling to push you into the movement. Right. Now, if we parents this up, we're doing back to back.
left footed position, it's a right footed position because you actually, by starting on to the left, you're pushing with the right. And your strong foot, unless you're left handed, or in this case, left footed. Anybody here who's left footed better keep quiet. <laughs> It's because that's the foot that pushes, so you, you actually move onto the left. It's nothing more clever than the fact that the military and so on, like smart soldiers, and the best way to do it is to push off on your strong leg. Right? There's only more magic that people just believe that you start on the right foot are already handicapping themselves. I don't mind this competitive world on my side saying so yours. <coughs> we will try again. One more try. Think of it. Pushing into it. As you hit, go.
Does anybody here think they were doing it? Keep quiet because I didn't notice it. Right. In other words, nearly everybody is standing still. Nowadays, standing still tends to mean being on your heels. Right? Now, if you're actually a dancer, you wouldn't have your heels touching the ground during the dance. But, uh, with the best dance positions, you wouldn't have heels on your shoes at all, because it's a <laughs> You actually are balanced. Walking is springy, it's dance, you know, it's nothing to do with clonking your heels there. Correct? Trainers are probably the worst thing. <laughs> but then, so boots and other things as well. Um, no, I expect you to be worry about your posture. Now, I, I know it's a lot of technique coming into this particular session, but posture is what the audience sees. And if you are standing on your heels, stomach forward, shoulders hunched, in the normal, natural English position, <laughs> you look like normal, natural English persons, sloppy, slack, and not really dancing. I'm expecting you to be on your toes, is the phrase, you know, on the balls of your feet with a weight over the balls of the feet, to be fairly well up, you know, eyes horizontal, necks, all oh, that's the thing about necks. You know, those people who jump and go, <laughs> or whatever it is, you know, probably have trouble with their necks. Right? You know, possibly have trouble with your back. Now the Alexander technique is all about worrying about the shape of your spine, particularly the bit at the top end here. You know, and really, they, what they suggest to you is that you sort of push your head up, you know, swing it and push it up. And get your high eyes to and push it up. If you're driving for a long time and you're not feeling too good, try to lift your head up a bit, you know, so that you feel it pushing up there. That's good. It improves the posture, that improves your ability to get through the hurting or something. There are lots of tricks of that sort. It's well worth talking to therapists or reading the old books in the library, things of that sort. But good posture is body language. Body language is what the audience sees. Well, it's probably not. The first thing they see is what a weird costume. <laughs> and they say, what strange looking people. Good God, do they let that sort of person do the Morris name? You know? And then they get around to saying, oh, they don't, they're not terribly excited by it, are they? They're not all eager to go, they're not bringing any message over. And yet, you know, by worrying about posture, you can win half the battle, because they only see how the dance stops and ends. All the rest is moving in between. You know? Oh, if you look at sides, how they come on and off? creates most of the impression that the audience gets. You may believe you've practiced all winter to actually do good dances. But the fact is you haven't. You've actually spent all winter enjoying yourself. <laughs> <laughs> right? What you don't probably practice, you probably don't practice the way you're going to go out. The golden rule of rehearsal is you practice the way you're going to behave when you're out. Because when you're under stress outside, like in front of people, you're going to behave, you revert back to your bad habits. And if you're sloppy at practice, I, where's the fifth one? Where's the fourth one? Where's the third one? <laughs> Getting annoyed with somebody, you know. You went to dance with clash of, uh, you should have got it right. You do it outside. We've all seen the other sides like it, haven't we? <laughs>
little bit more than hitting a stick. You know, it's uh, there's a body in it and there's a big boom. They all know when you're doing stick dances, no, you probably don't all know because you can do it otherwise. But most musicians are aware that sides speed up in stick tapping. And there's only one explanation for it is that people don't take long enough over what they're doing. Now that's a truism, of course. There's a proper technical word for it as well. But it's because you know, if you have something with a stick and you know, it involves you going, Yeah, be prepared. 